Well, welcome back to our class, Sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testaments. I see we have a new student tonight. <laughs> Alrighty, you might remember what we talked about last week, uh, Brother Adam. No. No. Meat offering, yeah. Burnt offering was two weeks ago. The meat offering was burnt, so technically you're right in that aspect. <laughs> well, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, tonight we will be talking about the peace offering, though. <laughs> and this offering, as we'll see, is a has some similarities to the last two, some elements of both, but also some unique differences, and its purpose is a lot different. Does anyone happen to know where the first mention of the peace offering is? That wasn't your homework, so it's okay if you don't know it. I'm sure Adam knows because he's seen the slides. <laughs> it's in a very familiar chapter of scripture, by the way. Uh, go ahead, Adam. Exodus 20, Yeah, Exodus 20, the, the Ten Commandments chapter. <laughs> we can turn over there and read this for a moment. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, uh, I'll look at a few other verses around this just so we can get some context. But you know, the peace offering is, like said it's a little different than the last two, but yet it contains elements of both the meat offering and the burnt offering. And here, after the Ten Commandments, as we call them, were given, you, know, you notice in verse 19, the, the Jews were a little scared skeptical I guess and they, it says they said unto Moses speak thou with us and we will hear let not God speak with us lest we die <laughs> you know, I, I don't know their thinking there I guess they thought if God spoke directly to them they would die but yet God spoke directly to many people throughout the scriptures and they lived just fine so. <laughs> anyway God gives Moses the this message here in verse number 22 it says and the Lord said unto Moses Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. Again, he reminds them not to make idols, false gods. And he says, verse 24, An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings and thy peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen in all places where I record my name I will come to thee and I will bless thee and if thou wilt make me an altar of stone thou shalt not build it of hewn stone for if thou lift up thy tool upon it thou hast polluted it nevertheless thou shalt go up or nevertheless shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon well, here, this is the first time the peace offering is mentioned in scriptures. We're, they are told to build this altar of earth and to offer upon it. I did think it was interesting, though, to notice verse 25. He says, If thou shalt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. But they weren't to make it pretty, if you will. They weren't supposed to alter. It really wasn't to be an, an attractive altar. Right. You know, we have a nice building here, and I, yet the main point of our building is not to attract people, is it? Right. You know, we don't have like some of these religions and denominations and big fancy buildings that, as I think Brother Spurgeon said, grand architecture and fine music. Well, he said you ought to go to where the tr truth is preached. Right. The altar wasn't necessarily a, to be attractive to man's eyes. 
here they were to offer their peace offerings along with their burnt offerings. And he said, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. That is really a key to the peace offering that God will come unto us. And it shows really a type of our fellowship with God. Let's go on to Leviticus. We'll go to chapter 3, then we'll go on to chapter 7. Chapter 3 tells us a lot about you know, how the peace offering is to be offered, but chapter 7 tells us more about its purpose. It goes into other details. There's a lot of repetition here in this chapter as well, for there's different types of animals allowed. Verse 1 says, And if his, or, and if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering... If he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer without blemish before the Lord. You know, the herd refers to cattle, oxen, cows, that's such animals. And just as with the burnt offering, it has to be an offering without blemish. You know, it had to be a perfect offering. But here we see the difference is that it could be male or female. You know, there's several theories out there of what that means. Some have suggested that it's because in Christ there is neither male nor female. Uh, Galatians 3.28 tells us. Uh, others think that it denotes both his strength and his weakness as, a male, as the male and as the female. So he was strong in obedience, but the scripture says he was crucified through weakness. Um, some have also suggested that the Male sacrifice represents him as man, and the female represents us. You know, man is described as being born of a woman. Right. And there is a two parts, I guess you could say, of the peace offering. It's both towards God, but it also affects the offerer, who is also for his benefit. Certainly Christ is our peace, and that's the ultimate fulfillment of this offering. He goes on in verse 2 to tell us how to offer it. And it says, And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. This is, as we saw with the burnt offering, they were to lay their hand, hand upon the head, which identified the offering with the offer as its substitution or as it's substitute, I guess I should say. And they were to kill it. So that the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And then Aaron, sons of the priest, they took the blood and they sprinkled it on the altar. I said much the same as with the burnt offering. Well, notice in verses 3 and 4 we see the difference here. And it says, And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the innards, and all the fat that is upon the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, with the kidneys, it shall take, or it shall he take away. So this was to be burnt upon the altar, just like the previous offerings were, but here it was to be the fat, and the kidneys, and the call. The call is a, a fatty piece that's attached to the liver. It's, as it says here, it's above the liver. The fat represents the best, as we'll see later on. It's supposed to, the kidneys is in scriptures is also translated reins. It uh, really ep represents the center of our affections. Some have suggested that the burning of the kidneys represented the fervency of Christ's affection towards His people. You know, by his great love wherewith he loved us. But they were to take all the fat, all the kidneys, all the call is called, anything that had fat on it, they were to take all that fat and to offer it upon the altar, to offer the best unto God. Uh, verse 5 says, And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire, 
that is an offering made by fire or sweet savor unto the Lord. So here it was to be offered along with the burnt sacrifice, and it says it's a sweet savor in the Lord. Once again, we see it was a you know delightful or pleasant odor to God. It was pleasing to Him. We'll go on to verse six here. There's a lot of Basically the same thing, but here is for if you offer the flock. Uh, verse 6 says, And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace, offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer without blemish. So here the flock refers to sheep and goats. With the same requirements, it has to be a male or female, and it has to be without blemish. Right. Really the lamb is what mentioned next, and it should be, it's really the perfect type of Christ. Verse 7 says, If he offer a lamb for his burnt or for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood there on, thereof round about upon the altar. So really the same as we saw in verse 2. Verse 9 and 10 are the same as we saw in verses 3 and 4, except we'll see they add one thing to it. It says, And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat thereof and the whole rump, it shall take off, or he shall take off hard by the backbone, and the fat that covereth the innards, and all the fat that is upon the innards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, with the kidneys it shall be, or with the kidneys it shall be taken, or it shall he take away. So we see all the fat, but here he adds, and the rump, the whole rump, it shall be taken off hard by the backbone. It said that sheep in the Middle Eastern area have very fatty tails. The same way in, you know, at least 10 pounds or more. So take it hard, take it off hard by the backbone means to take it off up against the backbone. It's in order to get all of it off of there. Really the whole rump was to be taken off because it included fat as well. And all the fat was to be offered to God. Verse 11 was the same as verse 5, and they burn it upon the altar, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire in the Lord. But here we see he mentions it's the food of the offering. It's That food is also bread or meat sometimes in the scriptures, but it indicates our fellowship with God. As we'll see when we get to chapter 7, there is a meal that goes along with this. Let's go on to the next verse here. It's pretty much similar to the sheep, but this time for goats. It says, and if, he, or, and if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of it, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. The sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about, and he shall offer thereof his offering, even an offering made by fire in the Lord, the fat that covereth innards, and all that fat that is upon the innards and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys it shall he take away and the priest shall burn them upon the altar it is food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor all the fat is the Lord's you know, he adds that at the end of verse 16 all the fat is the Lord's That was the purpose of taking all the kidneys, all the call, the the tail, and everything. Because the fat belonged to the Lord. The fat. In fact, in Genesis forty-five fifteen, we don't have to turn there, but the scripture says, "You shall eat of the fat of the land," referring to the best. Sometimes, in Numbers chapter eighteen, this word is translated as fat. I mean, as best. I don't remember all the references, but in verse 12, it says that we're to offer the best of the wine, the best of the oil. It's also used in three other verses in that chapter. So the fat indicates the best, and it belongs to God. He'll go on a little, in a lot more detail about verses 16 and 17, or the end of verse 16 and 17, when we get over chapter 7. It says in verse 17, It shall be a perpetual statute for your generation through all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat 
nor blood. The fat and the blood belong to God. As it says here, all the fat is the Lord's, but the blood was to be offered upon the altar. I also thought it was an interesting note. We are still commanded to abstain from blood. Mm-hmm. Acts fifteen twenty nine. If you remember that in that particular chapter, they were going back and forth on should the Gentiles keep the law or not. And they said, well, no, they don't have to keep the whole law. Just keep these things. And one of them was to abstain from things offered to idols, abstain from blood, and abstain from fornication. Right. No, he doesn't say we're abstaining from fat anymore, but we are still to abstain from blood. So let's go on over to... Ch- <laughs> yeah, okay. Go ahead, brother. Yes. I mean, they had certain reasons why. Was they trying to eat animals uh, while they were living? Or no. Really, I haven't seen anything other than that reference you made about the life is in the blood. That it seems like it's. And then they were, I mean, the reason I was asking, they were practicing something, or it was just, just for this meaning of the, the life that's in the blood. And, uh, I don't know if back then people were eating it raw. I know there are some. I know there's even some quote unquote delicacies that include blood in them. I think you have. It's definitely uh, used in a lot of ungodly ways, even today. Most of you see today is very satanic. Yeah, that's what the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> yeah, they could say it. There definitely are a lot of uh, diseases you can get from blood. <laughs> we'll go over to Leviticus chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Uh, I remember, uh, I know Brother Larry remembers my stepdad. I don't know if you know, he had hepatitis C, and um, he said, no, don't share his razors or toothbrushes or anything like that with him. He could transfer it through the blood to you. Leviticus chapter 7 verse 11 we'll go on down through things to verse 34 but here he gives more details on the peace offering he says and this is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offerings which he shall offer unto the Lord if he offer it for a thanksgiving then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving Let's stop for just a second uh, there was three reasons you could offer a peace offering, as we'll see here. The first one is a thanks for Thanksgiving or a thank offering, as it's sometimes referred to in Scripture. Another time is for if you vow a vow, you were to offer a peace offering. Mm-hmm. You offer, sometimes you could just offer it of your own free will, a voluntary offering. Mm-hmm. But here he gives the, I guess, the rules, if you will, for a 
thank offering, or if it's given for Thanksgiving, he says, he shall offer with the th- sacrifice of Thanksgiving eleven cakes mingled with oil, and eleven wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. This is just as we saw last week in the meat offering. The fine flour it was being made of un- unleavened, and he made cakes with it, and wafers with it, and it says cakes mingled with oil fried. Of course, the oil typifying the Holy Spirit. But we'll notice a, a big difference in verse 13. He says, Besides the cakes, he shall offer for the for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. If you remember from our last lesson, leaven was not to be offered upon the altar. Chapter 2, verse 11 tells us that no leaven or no honey were to be burnt upon the altar. So this leavened bread said to have been used, or said to have been given to the priest and to have been used in the feast that's to follow. Leavened bread, of course, being more pleasant to the taste than unleavened bread. I can't say I've ever went home after the Lord's Supper saying, man, I think I should bake me some unleavened bread. This being a type of our fellowship with God, it is a pleasant thing. So these leaven cakes were allowed here, leavened bread as it's called. And also another, possibly to show that even though we have peace with God, we still have sin present with us. Leaven being a type of sin, oftentimes in the scriptures. Let's go look at verse 14. He goes on to say, And of it, of the offering, he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for a heave offering unto the Lord, and it shall be the priest that sprinkled the blood of the peace offerings. But part of this they were taken, offered for a heave offering, which was, they literally just held it up before God. <laughs> they really indicated that it was God's, but it was to be given to the priest. I didn't turn my sound off. He was. It shall be the priest that sprinkled the blood of the peace offerings. Whatever priest it was that sprinkled the blood upon the altar, they were to get this part that was given as a heave offering. It says in the flesh, verse 15, of the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. Another thing I had, thought I had on the heave offering is lifted up to God. Christ was also lifted up to God on the cross. But here in verse 15, they were to eat the rest of the the sacrifice. You know, the, obviously the fat and the kidneys and such were already offered upon the burnt offering, but he says they shall eat it the same day that is offered. He shall not leave any until the morning. You'll see in a minute there were, in different circumstances, they were allowed to leave it till the next day. I'll get to that when we get to that next part with my thoughts on that. But, but they were to consume it completely. Some people had said maybe because it was given for Thanksgiving, you should give Thanksgiving right away to God. You shouldn't prolong that. It was to be eaten as a fellowship meal. If my understanding is right. Uh, you can go read Deuteronomy 12 sometime, particularly verses 11 through 18. They were to bring the offer was was to come. The priest joined in. The family they even could bid the poor people in the area to come and partake of this meal that was made of the of the cakes and the wafers and of course of the lamb or the the ox that was offered before the <coughs> the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offering for Thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that is offered. He shall not leave any until the morning. So they were not to waste any of it. Right. Do you have a question, brother? Uh, 
if the, that was the manna, if they left it, it was, or if they gather too much, yeah, they got In a sense, it was type of Christ was not wasted. <laughs> yeah, that's what we'll see here in a minute. On the next type of offering, they were allowed to eat the second day, but not the third day. Let's go on to verse 16 here. It says, But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offereth his sacrifice, and on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. Now, like I said, if this was, if he had made a vow, or if he just wanted to do it on his own free will, he was to offer it and eat that day, anything left, they were to eat the rest the next day. Verse 17 says, But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. When anything left, was to be burnt completely up. There was nothing to be wasted. Now, one of my thinkings on this was that, yeah, that on the third day, Christ rose that he wouldn't see corruption. Psalm 16, or 1610 says that thou will not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. You know, they didn't have a refrigerator or a freezer to stick their leftovers in, so right. it would spoil pretty quickly. I can't imagine it would be the greatest on the second day, but by the third day, it wouldn't be any good. I think one difference in the one of the reasons for the difference shows like God fellowships on His terms, not on ours. Right. You know, if He is, wants to fellowship with you today, or if He wants to fellowship with you today and tomorrow, then we are to meet with Him. We are to do as He says, not. Say, God, well, I'm free on Saturday at 3 o'clock. Right. Yeah, that's where most people give them Sunday at 10. you got two hours to meet with me, and if you don't, then I'll see you next Sunday. Right. But no, God meets with us. He fellowships with us on his terms, not ours. Thanks be to God if it's for two days, but some days it may only be for one day. Sometimes it may be for just a few minutes, right. especially when we're not right with him. I think that's kind of how what this meal indicates spreading our fellowship with others and telling others about his goodness verse 18 says and if any of the flesh or the sacrifice of his peace offerings be eaten at all on the third day it shall not be accepted neither shall it be imputed unto him that offereth it it shall be an ob abomination and the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity there was some from here the next several verses we see what is unacceptable to God regarding the peace offering. He says if he eats of it on the third day, it's an abomination. It's a, a foul thing is what that literally means. It's not accepted to God. It shall not be accepted. Neither shall it be imputed unto him. So really it was a pretty much a waste, if you will. Right. I think the implication here is that See how I put in my notes that by eating on the third day, we're implying that Christ was corrupt. Because we saw Christ was raised the third day that he wouldn't see corruption. You know, there's some obviously that believe that he didn't raise again the third day, that he's still over there. And that's not acceptable to God. That's without the resurrection, we are of all men most miserable, Scripture says. Notice it says at the end there that soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. Now I'm not, I don't think that means that he can never be saved, but he'll suf definitely suffer the consequences of his. If you happen to go over there and read about the jealousy offering that we mentioned in the first week, at the end of Numbers chapter 5, verse 31, it 
it says that if the woman was guilty, she shall bear her iniquity. Remember, her bearing her iniquity was given by the the swelling of her belly and the rotting of her thigh. It says a curse that was given. At the very least, she was not able to conceive again. I'm not sure what else happened there, but it wasn't a pleasant thing. Never is bearing your sins a pleasant thing. Right. But, you know, we are certainly forgiven in Christ, but we're not necessarily always free from the consequences of our sins. You know, I was joking with Brother Adam a while back about this movie. And this fellow supposedly gets saved in the movie. And he says, well... He's saying his all his stuff's been washed away, so, so that don't make you clear with the state of Mississippi. <laughs> he was running from the law. But you still have to face the consequences of your actions. To, right. You know, if you do drugs all your life, you can be forgiven in Christ, but that doesn't mean you might not suffer the health consequences later in life. Right. You know, if you drink all your life and are Certainly God can forgive you, God can save you, but yet that doesn't mean you won't have services to deliver or something else like that when you get older. <laughs> you definitely reap what you sow. So yes, we can be forgiven in Christ, but that doesn't mean we're free necessarily from the consequences of our sins. Even after we're saved, certainly He can cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but yet Sometimes we still have to bear those iniquities in our body. Right. Let's go on to the next verse. Uh, verse 19 it says, In the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burnt with fire. And as for the flesh, all that, or all that be clean shall eat thereof. Here, it could not touch any unclean thing. Uh, there were certain animals that were unclean. There were things that men could do that made them unclean. There were certain things that women did or naturally happened to them that made them unclean. We don't have time to go through all the uncleanness of the scriptures, but if anything unclean touched it, it was to be burnt with fire. It was no longer good to eat anymore. It was no longer good for a peace offering. But all that shall be clean shall eat thereof. You had to be clean, and the offering had to be clean. <laughs> Just like, really, we had to be clean spiritually to fellowship with God. Verse twenty says, "But thou, or but the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offerings that pertaineth unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people." Moreover, verse twenty-one: "The soul that shall touch any unclean thing." as the uncleanness of man or any unclean beast or any abominable unclean thing and eat the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings which pertaineth unto the Lord even that soul shall be cut off from his people well, here we see cleanness was an important thing in the sacrifice like I said just as we must be clean if you will to fellowship with God and he says that soul shall be cut off from his people, literally sentenced to death is what the, is how that phrase is used. So it's not a light thing to mess with the sacrifices of God. As I mentioned uh, I don't know, it was last week, maybe two sons of Aaron they offered strange incense upon the altar and they wound up dead. You know, but the priest didn't offer the sacrifices right, they would end up dead. Right. Just saying we should not mess with, if you will, the sacrifice of God which is in Christ. You know, we shouldn't try to change it to make it popular or make it more pleasant to the flesh. Right. God takes no pleasure in altering his sacrifices or doing it maybe our way or change it to be what we think it should be. I was thinking upon Romans eight thirty eight and thirty nine that says you know, that nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ. But in 
a sense this uncleanness was separating the offerer from God. Let's go ahead and look at verse 22. These next several verses here go back to what we saw at the end of chapter 3 about the fat being the Lord's and about they shall not eat any fat or blood. But here he expounds upon that and says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Ye shall eat no manner of fat of ox or of sheep or of goats, and the fat of the beast that dieth of itself, and the fat of that which is torn with beast may be used in any other use, but ye shall in no wise eat of it. For whatsoever eateth the fat of the beast, of which men offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, even the soul that eateth it shall be cut off from his people. See, we see that cut off again. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be of fowl or of beast, in any of your dwellings. Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. See, anything that belongs to God, we're not to use for any other purpose. That's what most people said, yes. Some people said it's specifically the sacrifice. and others thought it was just of the animals that were used as a sacrifice. You shall eat no manner of fat of ox or sheep or of goat, which were the three that were used for that. Wait. He said if it dieth of itself, if it's torn with beast, you may, he says, you may be using any other use, but you shall in no wise eat of it. But verse 25, he does say, Whosoever eateth the fat of the beast of which men offer an offering made by fire in the Lord, even that soul shall that eateth it shall be cut off from his people. So he definitely shouldn't eat what was to be sacrificed. Really, it's a type of taking from God that which is his and using it for your own purpose. And the same with the blood, which he's describes in the last two verses there you shall eat no manner of blood and that says in any of your dwellings so that seems to indicate in any circumstance you weren't to eat of the blood as we mentioned in Leviticus 17 11 says life is in the blood Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, man likes to figure out a way around, <laughs> make it easier on himself. I guess that's the nature of the flesh. fact, uh, isn't that what those were doing in the temple when Christ ran them all out? They were selling stuff. <laughs> House of merchandise. <laughs> but whatever belongs to God, we are to use specifically for him, not for ourselves, not for any other use, not for, you know, we need today take the things of God and use it for ungodly things. You know, the rainbow is one example, which I know there. Uh, if you notice the, whatever you want to call it, the gay rainbow, it's only six colors, and God's rainbow is seven. But man likes to take things that belong to God and distort them for his own use or his own, even his own godliness. Let's go ahead and look at verse 28 here through verse 31 it says and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto the children of Israel saying he that offered the sacrifice of his peace offering unto the Lord shall bring his oblation unto the unto the Lord of the sacrifice of his peace offerings his own hand shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire so you notice there he was to bring himself his own hand shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire 
the fat with the breast it shall be it shall he bring that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord and the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar but the priest or the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons here we see the wave offering as we mentioned they took it and they literally waved it up before God <laughs> first time that's mentioned is over in Exodus 29 24 we won't turn there tonight, but if you want to study it out sometime, you can. But that particular breast belonged to the priest, Aaron and his sons, as they're called here. Right. It was for their provision. But it was eaten along with the rest of the sacrifice. As we'll go on in the next few verses, we'll see. They also got the right shoulder. It says, In the right shoulder shall ye give unto the priest for a heave offering. There we see the heave offering again. Of the sacrifice of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron that offereth the blood of the peace offerings. And the fat shall have the right shoulder for his part. So the, the right shoulder was given to whichever priest offered the blood and the fat upon the altar. Once again, it's showing God's provision for him. Verse 34, it says, For the wave, breast, and the heave, shoulder, have I taken to the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings, and have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto his sons by statute for forever from among the children of Israel. The, the right shoulder in particular was mentioned here. The right always indicates favor. But these things were given to the Aaron and his sons, as they're called, the priest, to be their provision. That was probably one of their best things they got, actually. As we saw in the last time, they got the skins from the burnt offering. They got the unleavened bread from the meat offering. But here they seem to get some leavened bread and some breast and shoulder meat. So that this offering indicates fellowship with God. It's our peace. We are at peace with Him. There we, thereby we can have fellowship with Him. You know, there's a lot that we saw in this peace offering, but a few of the more significant things that take away from it is that it was still to be without blemish. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. It was voluntary went along with the burnt offering but this time it could be male or female but this is the only sacrifice in which part was eaten by the offerer which indicates both if I could say it this way the benefit of the offerer as well as God that both benefited from them for lack of a better word right. so we were made at peace with God which Certainly he enjoys our fellowship just as we enjoy our fellowship with him. <laughs> Did anyone happen to do their homework from last week to find the the largest peace offering? I see Adam has his hand up first. <laughs> what is it, brother? <laughs> Yes, that is correct. He dedicated the temple, and I'm gonna turn over there. The First Kings eight. There he offered. So they twenty-two thousand oxen, one hundred twenty thousand sheep. That was a very large offering. I can't. Imagine how long it took him to kill all those and burn them upon the altar, and yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of blood, a lot of certainly a large feast as well. 
Verse 64, that chapter says, The same day did the king hallow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. So he had to make another spot because the brazen altar wasn't large enough to receive it all. But... Yeah. In verse 65 it says, And at that time Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him. So they all took. Yeah, that'd be too much for one person. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Which the temple being built certainly was a great type of God fellowshipping with his people. And speaking of the Ark of the Covenant, that's the next scripture I wanted to look at is in Second Samuel chapter six. When the Ark of the Covenant was returned in David's time, he offered peace offerings. Second uh, Samuel chapter six. I'm trying to remember if we get all those facts right. I think it was in First Samuel chapter seven it was led away by the Philistines. And it wasn't until Second Samuel six here that David decided to go get it back from where, well, it had been brought at one time. I don't remember. It had been taken by the Philistines in the first Samuel, but then in chapter 7 of first Samuel, they did bring it back, but they put it in a Abinadab's house. And it stayed there all the way until David decided to go get it in chapter 6 of second Samuel. You know, in the beginning of the chapter, he went to get it and Let's see here. Oh, that's right. They shook the ark while they were carrying it, and they fell over dead. The, they, that scared David. He said, well, I'm not going to take this no more. So he turned off, and he put it in a... Let me find it here. Obed-Edom, the Gittite's house. After it stayed there a little while, he saw how Obed-Edom was blessed, so he said, well, I'm going to go get it back again. <laughs> Then we pick up here in verse 15 after it had been it was brought back and it says so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpets and as the ark of the Lord came in the city of David Michael Saul's daughter looked upon or looked through a window and saw David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart and they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in the place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. <laughs> so the, remember the peace offering was at times to be a, a thank offering. So imagine that's a type that David had given here at Thanksgiving that the ark was returned back to his rightful place. Really probably much as Solomon's was too. Thanks for the temple being completed I don't know they were very skeptical of the ark for whatever reason and I want to look at first Samuel and see how that the peace offering was not to go Saul of course he he's always seems to be our example of what not to do first Samuel chapter 13 We'll read verses 9 through 14. It says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offerings, the burnt offering 
or made an end of offering the burnt offering, he or beheld Samuel came. Samuel always had him figured out. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not with them the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Saul was a very good excuse maker. <laughs> if you remember, if you, uh, it's another scripture. He, you know, he said he didn't. He did exactly what Samuel told. Or yeah, Samuel told him to do. And Samuel said, "Why do I hear them sheep bleating?" <laughs> well, he said, "Oh, the people made me do it." I don't know. Saul always had an excuse. Here he says he forced himself because you know he hadn't made supplication before God. So. Verse 13 says, And Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Sam, or Saul didn't do it the Lord's way. He tried to do it his own way. Right. Instead of offering it as, you know, willingly and in thanksgiving and in faith, he, he did try to earn the favor of God. And that never works. Verse 14 says, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, that being David, of course. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. See, he bore his iniquity, didn't he? He says, For God would have, the Lord would have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But no, now someone else is going to take your place. You know, Saul, like I said, Saul made a lot of mistakes, but this is perhaps one of his worst ones. His kingdom wasn't be taken away from him because of it, because he he offered the burnt offering and the peace offering in the wrong manner. You know, Brother Junior read a scripture over in Psalms. I got it on my phone. I don't. I didn't write it down. But let's see if I can find it real quick. Psalms fifty-one, I believe it is. Yes. Psalms fifty-one, verse sixteen says, "For thou desirest not sacrifice; else would I give it. Un give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering." Now, certainly, God, in a sense, did take pleasure in burnt offering. I mean, that was what He commanded God, His people to do. But it wasn't just, it really wasn't the burnt offering and the offerings and the sacrifices itself that pleased God. It was obedience, yes, that they did it, one, according to his way, and two, by faith. Verse uh, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Verse 19 says, Then shalt thou be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullock upon thine altar. See, you could, you could bring these offerings and out of obligation or out of trying to get something out of it, but that wasn't the right way. He says, A, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. The right heart was the, is the key to the sacrifices. <laughs> it really, and that's like we mentioned. That was the problem with Cain and sacrifice. He didn't have the right heart. Do you think that's why Jesus did this? I mean, obviously Jesus was perfect. But do you think that's one of the reasons he did the Gethsemane? Was because he was trying to get his heart in order for the whole thing? That's a good possibility. We did pray for all night long. human said, I don't want to go. The 100% God said, 
No, it was, not my will, but thine will be done. I'm sure he knew the physical suffering, but even more the the spiritual suffering, if you will. He became sin for us, and God had to turn his back, if you will. <laughs> yeah, because as we'll get to, I think that's when he literally became sin. I don't. I'm not sure why it took Saul so long to get it. I don't know if he ever got it, but we do the same thing all the time, too, don't we? He certainly messed up a lot. I know that. No, I don't think he does either. So. so uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, but, but my, I, think you, I think you were saved, but I think you were just constantly at odds with God. Like, constantly inconsistent. Yeah, he was definitely constantly. Clearly, God didn't want them choosing between me and him. Well, I mean, that, not, that, that, not necessarily. Uh, God was the one that pointed him out to Samuel. It was, it was Saul's choices that got him where he was. Well, the truth is, though, make us. <laughs> Israel had God as their king and they wanted an earthly king. And they got Saul and he was a mess. Any other questions before we wrap it up? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I'm just going to close whenever you're done. Yeah, because you had to kind of throw it up. And, you know, that, that's the type of sacrifice. It's like living the Christian life. It, it's not easy. And uh, I think Michelle, the reason that she showed her true colors is because David was in the will of God. And she hated him for it. And that was Saul, I mean, that was Saul's daughter. She despised him, it says. She knew her daddy wasn't. <laughs> and, of course, I'm going to sound like Brother McCoy now. Uh, uh, every one of these were specific numbers. They, it, was not, it was never a general sacrifice. It was always specific. Even as a whole, the sacrifices were limited to, to Israel. Right. They weren't for the everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, if we got nothing else, we'll close up. Next week, we're going to be. Next week, we'll look at the sin offering, which is our longest chapter of of text. It's thirty-five verses. There's a few different. Uh, Provisions, I guess you could say, for the sin offering. If it was for a king or for 
common person or and it is different from the trespass offering <laughs> sometimes people use those as synonyms or as mix them up but there is a sin offering and a trespass offering right. and they have different purposes I guess you the homework I was going to assign for a night was to you define and figure out the purpose or the I guess the the meaning and the reason for the phrase without the camp which will be used in our next it's a not it's an old English saying we wouldn't say it like that anymore the, the I guess the purpose and the meaning of the phrase without the camp Alrighty. This will be done for the night then.